Hey there, guys. Welcome back. My family and I were down in the Red River Gorge area of Kentucky a couple of weeks ago. It was the kids' fall break, and that's our favorite place to go for fall. This was our fourth trip down there. It's just a, a humbling, majestic place to be if you like hiking and being outdoors. And uh, we were in one of the little trading post type stores down there. And this slingshot caught my son's eye. So we picked it up and uh, brought it back to the cabin. And uh, we spent a little time behind the cabin, he and I, picking up rocks from the driveway and uh, plinking them into the, into the trees behind the cabin. I hadn't messed with a slingshot in a long time, and it was very um, nostalgic. Always good to do simple things like that with my kids, but also nostalgic because it reminded me a lot of some things I would do in my own childhood. The joke on the trip was, how do you aim this slingshot? And the answer was, well, you just make the eagle look at uh, what you're trying to shoot at, right? <laughs> Nothing fancy here, just a simple bargain basement slingshot with the surgical rubber tubing or whatever they call this and a simple leather pouch but it's plenty good enough for some uh, simple fun But it really got me thinking. It got re me remembering. And when I got back from the trip, I, I dug around in some drawers. I found this old guy. This is the slingshot I made when I was a kid. Now I have no good reason why 
I still have this. Just a memento that I've drug along with me from house to house all of these years, I guess, but... Sentimental, I suppose. But there's something about a, a homemade slingshot that really speaks to me. It speaks to speaks to the past. It speaks to the the idea of being able to make your own entertainment when you're a kid, just using your surroundings. Now this, this natural fork would have come out of the uh, trees behind the house that I grew up in. I grew up on uh, about a four acre piece of land and about three acres of that was trees. So I had plenty of raw material for the fork. This is probably a uh, maple. That's what uh, most of the trees on our property were. And these rubber bands and, and this pouch are not from my childhood. I just put these on a couple of days ago when I was thinking about doing this video. I just wanted to show an example of how I would have rigged this up when I was a kid. And it was very much like this, with rubber bands and string and a pouch. Now back then, I, I was kind of lucky on the rubber band side. I, my mom had a ceramic shop that she operated out of the house when I was growing up, and you know, ceramics was one of those arts and craft type hobbies that was really popular in the 60s and the 70s. And to hold the molds together, she used these huge half inch wide rubber straps. And uh, I used a pair of those when I put my this first slingshot together, and they really worked fantastic. For this one, I just got a uh, package of quarter inch quarter inch rubber bands at the local uh, Walmart. Can find these anywhere. They have the side benefit of making some great sounds.
nothing fancy here. Just take four of them and cut them so that they lay out like this. And that is all you need for a, a simple slingshot such as this. And this leather pouch, the one I used when I was a kid, was shoe leather. It was uh, part of a tongue of an old, worn-out leather work shoe that my uh, dad had. And I just cut the uh, tongue out and uh, cut a rectangle very close to this size. That, that shoe leather made a fantastic pouch. And then it's nothing more than putting the pieces together. Tying the string on was usually a two-person project because one person would grab the loose ends of the rubber band and stretch it. And the other person would just take some cotton string and... Uh, tie multiple knots, and when you let go, the rubber band gripped the, the fork, and it was perfectly fine. But like I said, the real, the real nostalgic part of this for me is the concept of making your own entertainment, right? The ability to be entertained by your surroundings and to, to have that imagination to make something out of nothing. I know I was really lucky growing up on a, a property with some trees. Three acres of trees might not sound like a lot, but to a young kid, it's, it's a nearly endless playground. Always fun exploring, figuring the property out, understanding the little nooks and crannies. I hope that that's what kind of laid the foundation for my appreciation of the outdoors and my interest in continuing to get outside when I can now as an adult and hopefully I'm passing that same appreciation down to my kids. Because there's so many tempting distractions these days with electronics and the virtual worlds that you can access through games and a million other things. Not saying that's bad by any means, but it's competition, right? It's competition for the imagination. A lot has been written about what's been called nature deficit disorder and and the fact that kids these days are so much less engaged with the outdoors and their surroundings as the prior generation was and the generation before that.
think it's kind of hard to put all the blame at the kids' feet, though, for something like that, because... Kids still depend on adults to show the way, model the behavior that we want to try to pass down. So if kids these days are not outside as much as their parents were when their parents were kids, I guess I wonder whether the parents are getting outside either. It's hard to reconcile all of the priorities. Parents are busy. It's hard to get everything done. spent some time on this last trip to the gorge on top of our favorite place to hike to when we're down there. It's called Double Arch. You should look it up sometime. When my kids and I get on top of a place like that, we just we just spend time just taking it all in, right? I mean, the, the, the views at a place like that are just magnificent. They're, they're simply awe-inspiring. Sometimes we'll have trail mix with us or whatever, and we'll just park ourselves on top of one of those arches and just take in the surroundings in silence, just eating our trail mix and staring in awe at what we're seeing. And when we were up there this last time, a, uh, a group of kids, probably high school aged kids, came up after we had been there for a little while. There was maybe five or six of them. And they looked around. They turned in all directions to, to scan the horizon. They were busily chatting amongst themselves. They took a few pictures. And then, seemingly satisfied after a couple of minutes of, of that view, they noisily moved on. They were there, I'd say, two minutes tops on top of that arch. This is uh, this is one of the most dramatic 360 degree views in the gorge. Certainly the most dramatic that we've found so far in in four years of exploring the area. This is a view that has been striking awe into native peoples for thousands of years. And these kids uh, could only spend about 
two minutes of their attention on what they were seeing. And it just struck me, you know. It just left me thinking, you know, if an experience like this doesn't make the cut, if a view like this can only capture a couple of minutes of your attention, I don't know. Makes me, uh, makes me worry a little bit. Certainly not saying that everybody's priorities need to be the same, and obviously everybody's interested in different things. But We should never lose the fascination with uh, the natural world around us. We should never let the, the temptations of all of the virtual worlds that we can spend so much time in convince ourselves that somehow those are more compelling, more... more engaging than being surrounded by the real thing. You hear so much about VR and 3D and all of these attempts to model the real world in a virtual space. Let's not forget that the real world is still the real world and it's still out there waiting for us. It's still amazing and powerful and compelling and the scale of it all can can put some amazing context around your own existence and your own place in the scheme of things. And that's a valuable experience. That's a valuable perspective. It really helps calibrate the brain. especially when we struggle so much with our with our real life things, our jobs and relationships and all of the things that we've got going on. Sometimes you just need to stand at the base of a really huge arch in Kentucky to be reminded to have that context put around stuff. So anyway, get outside. Get your kids outside. Spend more than two minutes on the next big natural feature that you encounter. It doesn't have to be anything special. It could be something at the local park. You'd be amazed how many discoveries you can make in a small babbling stream. Slow your brain down so that you can be receptive to that kind of stuff. Sometimes we move so fast and we're trying to solve so many issues in our brains at once. Sometimes you would just slow down. Bring all of your thoughts to bear on one simple thing. You'll be amazed at the discoveries that can reveal themselves.
make your own entertainment. Take advantage of all of the, the wonder around you. Make that your playground. You don't need a screen. You don't need electricity. It's all out there waiting for us. We just need to remember to prioritize it properly. You guys take care of yourselves and each other. And thanks for joining me again. And we'll see you next time, okay? Bye-bye.